Bonjour à tous, bienvenue. Good morning everyone and welcome to this session. Thank you for braving the rain and for having come in such large numbers. Vaccinating the world's population, that is the topic for this session. Obviously, it's of crucial importance because uh, the world still faces a pandemic, COVID-19. That's three million dead people in the world. I don't think I'm mistaken, that's the figure I read. So, can one vaccinate the entire population of the world? What are the priority populations? What policy should be introduced in a world where 90% of the vaccinated population is located in the rich northern countries? What global strategy can be the winning bet against this uh, pandemic? How can we uh, overcome the variants? And also, can we uh, reach herd immunity? I have with me Marisol Tournen, a former Minister of Health, President of UNITED. That's a, a multilateral organization which works a bit like the COVAX, and we'll uh, be talking about that. So welcome to Marisol uh, Touren. Odile Launay, an, an expert in infections, a member of the uh, COVID-19 uh, panel, and also she uh, works uh, for the French-speaking uh, uh, vaccination uh, company. We have a colleague from Dakar. Uh, welcome. You are the head of infectious diseases in the National Teaching Hospital in Senegal. Welcome, uh, Moussa Saidi. Before we launch the discussion, Akiko Suwa Eisenman is with us, and she's going to uh, uh, describe the general situation. She belongs to the circle of economists, of course. Thank you, and good morning to you all. In terms of vaccination against COVID-19, we have to welcome the uh, feat. Uh, vaccines were developed uh, in less than a year, of course, uh, with uh, 10 years of uh, prior fundamental research. These vaccination vaccines were used by WHO, and there are several others in clinical trials. End of June, 3 billion doses of vaccines were distributed around the world. That is 40 doses for 100 people. Over and above this success, we can wonder about the distribution of these vaccines, the sharing out. Under half of the population over 12 years of age is fully vaccinated in the U.S. and the U.K. to end June, 30% in France. But that's the case uh, of only 12% of Brazilians, uh, likewise South Koreans, 4% of Indians, and less than 1% of South Africans. The uh, rapid development of uh, vaccines is uh, quite a feat on the part of states and the TP uh, alliances. These multiple initiatives show the strength of society. Uh, perhaps there was a lack of coordination in efforts, however. State strategies were very different. The U.S., for example, invested massively and early on in the entire chain, that is, in the development of vaccines and uh, in uh, production units. The EU, conversely, uh, acted uh, on a group level in the area of uh, research and uh, as a group, but uh, for its own sake in purchasing. There's a geopolitical uh, aspect to vaccines, and look at uh, Russia and China. This uh, is, uh, the latter is the leading uh, COVID uh, vaccine supplier in developing countries on a multilateral effort. Public-private alliances boosted uh, vaccination City Accelerator and others. This is a world partnership. Uh, the idea is to accelerate the access of poor countries to tests, to treatment, to vaccines against COVID-19, and strengthen their health systems. The uh, vaccine uh, arm is COVAX. COVAX uh, wants to buy 2 billion doses of vaccines uh, in order to cover 20% of the population in poor countries by the beginning of next year. But we are a far cry from achieving that aim. In the face of the shortage of vaccines, uh, the debate has focused on an increase in production. People have talked about uh, lifting patents uh, temporarily. Also, what happens in practice? Pharmaceutical companies have entered into joint agreements to produce uh, COVID-19 vaccines uh, developed by others. Another position, the rich countries could pay to uh, produce and distribute vaccines around the world. Another solution would be for rich countries to buy the patents of pharmaceutical companies 
remunerating them for their investment in R&D while opening up the technology to all. The cost would be gigantic, but that's nothing compared with the cost of lockdowns. In the short term, it's difficult to create a vaccine production plant. Look what happened with the, the plants in the U.S. and their complaints by existing producers because they're complaining of a shortage of qualified workers and entrance uh, bio uh, reagents, etc. Given the situation, what share of the world population could uh, we reasonably hope to vaccinate in the months to come? Then depending on the share, what are the scenarios that lie ahead? Can we achieve herd immunity? And what percentage of the population has to be vaccinated in order to uh, cope with the variants and with what vaccines? Third pathway. Couldn't we uh, try to minimize the number of deaths around the world? But uh, might it not be necessary not to vaccinate healthy young people in rich countries and give priority to caregivers and uh, the elderly and the poor in the poor countries? Should we try and live with the virus, as some other people have said, and uh, uh, therefore focus on young people, those who work and those who travel? Thank you, Kiko. Akiko. Odile Lone, can we say today uh, there's this equality, inequality between North and South? It's blatant in terms of vaccination. Can we say today that vaccination is the solution against the pandemic on a global basis? Well, maybe by way of introduction, I'd like to say that we're very fortunate to have had vaccines so quickly that work so well. In the space of under a, a year, no one would have thought that we would have these vaccines. And these vaccines are both effective, 90% efficacy or even more with the RNA ones. And these vaccines aren't a problem in terms of safety profile either. That's quite a feat. Three billion people vaccinated around the world. Of course, there are some side effects, granted, but they're not all that serious, and they're very rare. So that's uh, we're extremely fortunate. Now, how are we going to make best use of these vaccines? Some countries have the means to buy them, and there's great inequality in that respect when it comes to access to the vaccines. It's not the same vaccines which are available in the north or in the south. The north uh, is widely vaccinated, even if. Um, We've reached a glass ceiling. We can talk about that later. Some people are reluctant to get vaccinated, whereas uh, uh, we have uh, good proof to uh, show the need to get vaccinated. And in the South, uh, there aren't uh, enough vaccines available. If we don't try to vaccinate the South, we will end up with a virus that will continue to mutate, and some of these mutants may become more resistant to vaccines and antibodies as well. The other uh, approach is monoclonal antibodies. We have to do our utmost, therefore, to ensure that we increase the uh, vaccine coverage in the country and vaccinate countries in the south in order to avoid the emergence of these variants. We know today that it's impossible to close our borders to avoid the introduction of these variants. So the success of vaccination, and that's the only weapon we currently have, hinges on vaccinating widely to protect the most fragile people and also to avoid the circulation of variants which potentially might become resistant to the vaccines currently available. And how do you explain this glass ceiling that you talked about? In all of the countries in the north, including in the US, there is a reluctance to get vaccinated. So people, these countries are attaining the glass ceiling. Well, ever since the vaccine vaccines have existed, there have been people who are uh, hesitant. WHO defined this hesitation as one of the major public health problems in the world. And uh, we're directly faced with this issue now. There are various factors. The first factor is the lack of trust in leaders in particular in our countries. I believe that opinion polls show today that the main factor is the lack of confidence. We saw that throughout the crisis. There's a lack of confidence in leaders and experts, uh, and this lack of confidence has even uh, increased in the course of the pandemic. People are worried about side effects, uh, uh, both for oneself and one's children. Those are some of the concerns. And also there are other factors. The social networks play a major part in this, not only in our countries, because we can clearly see what circulates on the uh, social networks. We talked about this uh, with our colleague from Senegal. This is even more true 
of the developing countries where access to information via the social networks is, is huge. We've talked about the glass ceiling in countries in the north. Only 3% of the African population has been vaccinated. That's uh, not much. You have the COVAX initiative, which is supported by WHO, the World Health Organization. It aims to provide access to vaccination in the poor countries. Is this sufficient? Is it insufficient? Will it be very difficult to vaccinate uh, people in Africa? Did you hear the question? Did you hear my question, Dr. Sedi? Uh, yes, I, I hear your question. Can I answer in French? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. I was, de Molière. I was only hearing in the English uh, translation. Okay. Uh, merci. Je pense que l'initiative. I think that the COVAX initiative alone uh, will not suffice. It's an important initiative, of course, uh, that must be upheld. We need initiatives that highlight bilateral and multilateral cooperation. Senegal, for example, cooperates directly with other countries to get vaccines. That's what we have done with China. Senegal is also trying to get vaccines by a sub-regional organizations. So I think one has to multiply efforts to obtain vaccines and do one's utmost to ensure that things are complementary and not uh, com in competition. We have to use several pathways at the same time. I think that's what we have to do in the very short term. In the medium term, of course, it's important for vaccines to be produced here in Africa. This uh, uh, production can take place in Dakar, for example. We have an entity which is, I believe, one of the three or four biggest uh, uh, manufacturers of yellow fever vaccine in the world. And we have this, in fact, in Senegal. These vaccines are made in Senegal. We have the technology. Of course, there's the issue of patents. But if we put aside patents, then I think we will have to uh, compensate the owners. Otherwise, we'll kill off innovation. If we uh, lift uh, patents, that would be quite logical. It, otherwise, it would be uh, failing to help people in danger. But there has to be compensation. Otherwise, we'll kill off innovation, and that will create further problems in the future. So I, we, have, we have to think about this matter quite seriously. That's, in a nutshell, what I wanted to say in terms of vaccines and what we need to do very quickly to ensure that there are enough vaccines to go around. I have another question. What vaccines do you currently have in Senegal? Uh, you have Chinese vaccines, and do you have AstraZeneca? Yes, we have uh, uh, the vaccines via COVAX, and we have AstraZeneca in addition to the Chinese vaccines. We have placed a huge order for AstraZeneca vaccines, and we placed a big uh, order for J&J. &J. We don't yet have uh, RNA vaccines, uh, but uh, there are a number of uh, countries which have already ordered uh, Pfizer because storage conditions have changed. After unfreezing, the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine can be uh, kept in a fridge for a month now, and even after opening the bottle, the vial, one can use it between 6 and 12 hours later. So that's not really a problem. One shouldn't forget that there is a whole network here in Senegal, thanks to the uh, vaccination program. We can uh, vaccinate uh, with all sorts of vaccines uh, within 48 hours. Marie Soren, you run a multilateral association for treatment. You distribute uh, treatments, drugs, oxygen in four countries. WHO says that you need an additional $5 billion uh, to uh, uh, really implement uh, the COVAX initiative to the hilt. Is uh, international solidarity sufficient today? 
Well, yes, thank you. I'd like to say a few words about Unitake, which is an international multilateral body. It's a partner of WHO. It has been around for about 15 years now. It uh, implements a very concrete operational solutions to foster access to health uh, for all around the world, in particular in low-income countries or middle-income countries. One of the ways of fostering access to health consists in uh, lowering the cost of treatment, drugs, or uh, diagnostic tests, and that's one of the specialties of Unitate. I'll give you an example. I think we'll have an opportunity to go into greater detail later on, but I'd like to give you an example against uh, AIDS, uh, HIV AIDS. Treatment costs $10,000 in Europe. We have negotiated a price of $60 in a lot of African countries, so that's very specific action. So you do a lot of negotiations, yes. When we talk about uh, licenses and patents, I'll revert to that matter because I think it's a, a paramount importance. I'd like to add one point to the analysis made. In the context of uh, COVID, one shouldn't forget the other diseases. COVID has made populations more vulnerable to these other diseases. HIV AIDS, that's one a million deaths per year in the world. 90% of them are in the south. Tuberculosis, one and a half a million deaths uh, in the south in particular. And we think in the next five years, uh, because of the COVID epidemic, the number of deaths will increase by 30% deaths from AIDS and tuberculosis. So we need to fight COVID, first of all, to ensure that people don't fall ill, and also to enable us better to treat the population uh, which may contract these other diseases. Before going any further, I'd like to insist on the fact that if we need to vaccinate and to uh, provide diagnostic tests and treatment, it's for three reasons. We need uh, international pledges, first of all. Let's not forget that for humanitarian reasons, ethical reasons, uh, human dignity. It's simply not acceptable to see people die because they don't have oxygen. We've seen pictures which are unbearable, whereas uh, these solutions exist. And we can provide solutions for these people. Second reason, over and above uh, the humanitarian reasons, there are health reasons. We know full well in international organizations, uh, World Health Organizations, that we cannot hope to be protected here if uh, people aren't protected throughout the world. Uh, viruses know no borders. Travel is uh, just part of life today. And if we want to be able to avoid a resurgence of the epidemic, if we want to be able to avoid a resurgence of the epidemic, we simply have to vaccinate uh, people in the South. And there's a third economic reason. The uh, economic impact of the epidemic around the world is huge, and it costs a lot of money for us, too. We uh, will achieve greater growth if uh, countries in the South are vaccinated as well. And that's why we are mobilized and we're working within ACTA, which groups together various uh, vaccination and treatment programs via Unitel, Oxygen, for example. Diagnostic tests are provided, and then the aim is to reinforce the uh, health systems. And the COVAX system, well, that's one of the pillars in this uh, multilateral initiative. It distributes vaccines. In terms of COVAX and ACTA in general, this is a spectacular success. It was put together in just a, a couple of weeks. Things were set up in April 2020 in the space of just a few weeks. Unitech for vaccines, the World Fund and other things, they all met together and the decision was taken to achieve a, a, an operational response. We can see today, however, that we lack sufficient means. We lack political visibility. We uh, lack about 5 billion, 16 billion for 2021, not just for vaccines, but also for treatment and tests and so on. 16 uh, billion, that's 0.5% uh, uh, not even the recovery plans in the developed countries. So 16 billion 
that is within the reach of the richest countries, 16 billion. That would enable us to slow down, perhaps not eliminate, but slow down the progression of the disease, avoid a lot of deaths, and avoid a resurgence of epidemics in various countries, avoid uh, uh, the collapse uh, of economies in the south. So we really need these resources, and it's the countries in the north that have these resources. They must pledge them. We need greater uh, political visibility too. Today, we have to ramp up. We created UNITED and other organizations uh, at the time of AIDS, and now I think we have to uh, go further. Uh, project multilateralism should acquire a political dimension, a political structure, which is more effective, because if there is no policy or political leader, then we will depend on the goodwill of rich countries, developed countries, which may or may not give money. France has shouldered its responsibilities, it's played the game, but there aren't that many rich countries that have done so. Odile, what about the variants? Odile are they vaccine resistant? What about Delta, Delta Plus, SARS-CoV-2? Is it going to mutate endlessly? Because there's a real race between vaccines and variants today. This uh, virus belongs to the coronaviruses, and these are viruses which can mutate. They mutate in order to gain a transmission um, advantage. We had the Alpha variant, the English variant, and now we have the Delta variant. And each time, the variant uh, becomes increasingly uh, transmissible. That's the risk. These viruses are, are increasingly contagious. Their organization, their structure, their genome is going to change each time to enhance uh, uh, transmission. The mutations, which have been observed so far, has uh, only a moderate impact uh, on the efficacy of your immunity, be it natural immunity following infection or immunity following vaccination. Despite everything, as we've seen, the Delta variant does reduce the efficacy of vaccines. We saw this in particular in the UK, where they decided to uh, vaccinate uh, swathes of the population with just one dose. And with one dose, the efficacy is less good. It was less good in terms of the British variant, the English variant, but with the Delta variant, the uh, efficacy is much lower. You need to have uh, uh, many more antibodies to combat this variant. France is, has less of a problem because uh, the vaccine policy is based on two doses, so you have a high level of antibodies, and the vaccines are very effective against this variant, even if the efficacy is slightly less good. The concern today is that this virus will continue to evolve. The more it circulates, it's mathematical, the more mutations may arise, and these mutations will trigger not just uh, in an increase in transmission, but the virus will become less sensitive to uh, immunity through vaccination. Monoclonal antibodies are the only therapeutic weapon we have at our disposal. So, no concern currently with the, the Delta variant, as long as you've had your two jabs. It'll probably be necessary to have a booster quite quickly, a third dose, at least for the most fragile people who were vaccinated first, that is the elderly. Probably there will be a third dose, a third jab, which will be recommended in October or something like that. For the time being, this is not yet official. Could there be a cocktail of vaccines? Well, all of the vaccines target uh, the same thing. All these vaccines are directed against the spike protein, which is in the envelope of the virus and enables the virus uh, to bind to cells and enter the cells. All the vaccines are directed against the spike protein. There is research uh, on second generation vaccines which might target other uh, proteins, but what works really well today is the spike protein. And uh, that's what the vaccine does. That's why it can change. Uh, things, and uh, uh, but the, with the mutations, the virus will become less sensitive to vaccines. 
One shouldn't be pessimistic, but people should be vaccinated as quickly as possible to limit circulation, should get their two jabs. I think that's very important. You can get one dose of AstraZeneca, another of Pfizer. You could alternate, move from one vaccine to the other. We don't have much data. We have a little bit of data on the combination of Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca in combination. The Brits have launched a huge trial to look at this combination. We call this uh, heterologous uh, vaccination using two different uh, vaccine technologies. But in any event, in the case of France, we're going to uh, use mainly uh, messenger uh, RNA. Despite everything, there can be uh, potentially severe side effects with AstraZeneca. They've been covered widely in the media. Hence, uh, these vaccines won't get the priority compared with the messenger RNA, which uh, vaccines are very effective and one can quickly uh, create uh, new vaccines which are effective against the variants. And they have hardly any side effects, very few indeed. These are new vaccines. So we've never had uh, such vaccines in the past. It's quite a revolution in terms of technology. And this uh, opens the door to uh, uh, research uh, based on this technology, which in the years to come will no doubt uh, be a huge uh, plus. Uh, there'll be uh, particularly when vaccines are less available or less effective. So it's probably these vaccines that will be used uh, most, unless uh, Sanofi Pasteur uh, provides a really good alternative in terms of a booster. It's a traditional vaccine based on the same technology as uh, for hepatitis B or other vaccines. Okay, Dr. Sidi, we can see today that there is uh, a lot of vaccination nationalism uh, ever since the beginning of the pandemic. Some countries were to vaccinate vaccines in the south, but they're keeping their vaccines because they're contending with a huge wave today. What would you like to say about world solidarity? Do you agree with Marisol Touraine? There has to be more international solidarity. Countries in the north really have to become mobilized in order to ensure that countries in the south can get vaccinated. Yes, of course, we need we need solidarity since this. The, we can only get out of these pandemics together, otherwise we'll sink together. Because if part of the world doesn't have access to vaccine, indeed new variants will certainly uh, appear, develop, and they will probably, they could even be uh, able to escape diagnostic. You know, va vaccines are uh, efficient or efficacious on some of the variants we know, but we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So solidarity is needed for all. But African countries should try to mobilize their own national or domestic resources in order to vaccine their populations and not just wait for support from elsewhere. They need to take into consideration their um, characteristics or specificities for Moderna and Pfizer. We know that the storage conditions are of sort of more uh, to tolerant and even outside of a fridge, they can be kept for several hours, from six to 12 hours. So we must use all possible vaccines and of course, in, uh, you know, invite researchers to e examine the combinations of several vaccines. For it's very complicated sometimes to do combos, what we call the combos. You know, it's sometimes difficult to use several vaccines and ask people to do a, a sort of a, a second run vaccine with a, another one. The AstraZeneca was finished, for example, in Senegal, and people who needed a second dose had to wait up to four weeks. So. Uh, when it comes, we could lose uh, some um, members of the population because they come to the uh, healthcare center to be vaccinated, and then they're, we're, they're being told to come back the, the, to come back in one week time. So we have, really have to look at the possible combos. Uh, uh, three days ago, we had a meeting at the Ministry of Health, and I proposed uh, we should. We, I said, well, we should try mobile strategies. Some people actually face problems to travel because of availability or because of uh, of means. I mean, so maybe we have to bring vaccines to the people who need them.
uh, as we do in the broader vaccination uh, programs where mobile vaccination unit went to the villages. This is how we were able to do a good uh, vaccination coverage. So we have to adapt our strategy based on the uh, African context. Solidarity indeed, but we do have mobilized our uh, mo uh, domestic resources to move, to make headways. We cannot uh, be in a one-way form of solidarity. We have to enter this international collaboration and we insist on the fact that Africans have to fight to find their own solutions to their own problems. This is the way. Uh, this will increase the, eff the efficacy of international support. India is a disastrous situation, and therefore they cannot send their vaccines. And let me close on that note that we do have we right now only 3% of the COVID cases in the world are in Africa and 3% uh, of the um, casualties. So uh, countries which uh, need these vaccines need them too, you know, need the vaccines. So solidarity has to take place. But you have to, we have to raise the awareness of African countries in order for results to be faster. Marisol Touraine. Joe Biden uh, called for the lifting of uh, patents on the COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Is it a good idea to lift uh, patents or is it a political coup? Uh, well, a uh, trick. Well, this is one of the specialty of uh, United to work on patents. But I'd like to react to what Dr. Saidi said. It's quite fundamental. Today, we face an emergency situation, and whenever there is emergency, we need emergency uh, uh, answers. And uh, it's a donation of vaccines, the implementation of oxygen plans, the, what is United does to provide tests and so on and so forth. But of course, of course, we must help and promote the local capabilities and capacities. We have to work with governments and with local communities, communities of patients. And this is what we do for AIDS, tuberculosis, uh, malaria. Just imagine that digital solidarity, uh, you know, as an organization coming from outside, come with programs, treatment, leave uh, boxes of uh, drugs, uh, inject vaccines, the arm population and go away. This would be like a suicidal and, you know, madness. We need, this is something we're becoming aware of recently, we must invest as well in the reinforcement of healthcare systems. And in order to be efficient, we must rely on local governments, on local populations, on the uh, uh, patient communities, on professionals, healthcare professionals. So I come to this question of, uh, of patents because it is associated with that. So, on, about vaccine, we can discuss the usefulness of the lifting of patents. It is a, 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 a stake that will take time. The central element is to foster the production capabilities. In order to do so, we need three things. We need to have access to the patents, and therefore United, United does not uh, impose lifting of uh, patents, you know, they, they, to, uh, to take the European formulation. We do not impose, we don't ask a company to uh, seize its rights. We negotiate on a voluntary basis to preserve innovation and the innovation capabilities of companies. We will negotiate on a voluntary basis a temporary sharing uh, of the patent, you know, in a targeted manner. We did that for the diseases and it works. Early on, I gave you the example of the price for AIDS, but I could take, a, a, for example, auto tests. We distribute them in Senegal. Uh, they go from $40 to $1 for several diseases. We need a sharing. It's a kind of a subtle ma uh, manner, but we need a, vol a voluntary sharing of uh, patents. Basically, the company renounces its intellectual property rights, but within a legal framework which is not similar to that of the World Health Organization. I will spare you the technical details, but basically, we preserve the acknowledgement of innovation of com uh, created by companies. Second thing we need, you know, we need to share or lift patents, the technological transfers. There we said that we are ready to help companies even by cover, pay, paying or taking, paying, covering the cost of people who are going to 
train uh, uh, other uh, operators in foreign countries. So we are ready to act as facilitators so that people may go and do technological transfer. Third, we need to create production platforms in countries of the South. Actually, France is supporting one of the production platforms in South Africa, and we united because we do have a structure that, which does this in a specific manner. We've committed ourselves to the product, to implementation of production platform. So having said that, we need the international solidarity because it takes time. We cannot imagine that this uh, old system will uh, lead to local vaccine production or treatment local production before nine to 12 months. And what applies to for vaccines today will, va will be valid for tomorrow for treatments. I insist on that note. And let me close on one note. The, well, the, the, the regret or the, 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 the anger we may have retrospectively is that whenever states in the north negotiated the contracts for R&D contracts with pharmaceutical labs, uh, they should have considered this. United asked for it. United asked for the contract to integrate solidarity elements uh, like built-in or transfer, uh, solidarity or transfer uh, elements, uh, at least for the transfer of doses of vaccine. We, we've, we've lost about a year. And if we could get that, if we were able to ask that, it's because the amazing innovation uh, coming from vaccine has been made possible through public money. You know, the research capabilities of laboratories was quite spectacular, but without public money and public money, we're talking, we're talking hundreds of billions, you know, especially in the U.S., uh, you know, but okay, which were, which took place in the U.S. Therefore, this financial commitment of northern countries gave them the possibility to, in fact, uh, uh, have a, to impose a solidarity right vis-à-vis uh, -vis the labs and the uh, and the fear of the uh, pandemics in the north prevented countries from doing so, and uh, we can feel sorry about that. But it's not too late. No, but of course, but we're not at a time of negotiation. I mean, in, this is uh, what Joe Biden is proposing. You know, lifting of patents. Showing where well, we'd like the, the U.S. to give more doses initially because they kept their doses, whereas Europe should have said it, well, should have said, well, gave doses to other to countries in the south. It is a political signal, and it's a very, very important political signal, which means that the international community has to be ready to accept measures which are far more fundamental and more structuring. My message is simple, is that if we want countries in the South to uh, handle their future and their health care, we cannot live, remain uh, in the application of a solidarity strategy. We need a solidarity because it's a long road ahead, but donations do not suffice. We need more structuring or structural policies, and the structural policies mean that they should be uh, with discussing patents, intellectual property rights, the development of production capabilities, and the, the enforcement of healthcare systems. We are not uh, going overnight. Overnight, we, there will be no vaccine production if the healthcare system cannot ensure this uh, action. So it's a medium, long-term uh, project, which is not uh, does not deny. The, it does not exclude the solidarity, but this COVID uh, pandemic, which is a global uh, pandemic, global disaster, should make it possible to do goods, you know, go, common goods, as jean Tirol says, but also policies, more structural policies, you know, new, that would make it possible for countries of the South to uh, really handle their future in healthcare. Is it possible to achieve herd uh, co um, immunity? Are we going to live with this uh, virus? You know, do we have to get vaccine once a year? And eventually, uh, you get to vaccine young people in mature countries, in northern countries. Will it, do, will it be done to the detriment of those sent to the southern countries? Which should be the targeted population in the north today? And do, should we make vaccination uh, mandatory? 
Well, collective immunity, well, in fact, it's the proportion of the population which is either through vaccination or through infection, which has developed defense. And uh, if you are, when they were exposed to the virus, you do not get infected and you do not transmit the virus. This collective, this herd or collective uh, com uh, immunity may be reached at uh, more or less significant uh, percentage of the population. Let's take uh, smallpox e to get herd uh, immunity and prevent the uh, circulation of the of the virus. So 95 percent has to be vaccinated with vaccinated with or at least two doses with Sar SARS-CoV-2. Uh, SARS-CoV-2. What was modernized is that we needed 60 percent of the population um, vaccinated or infected to basically reduce the circulation of the virus. The virus has evolved, we mentioned it, and this virus is more and more transmissible. And today, the models of the uh, Institut Pasteur mention immunity as of 90% of the population, uh, in, you know, which is immunized, which is quite a significant proportion. And if the virus keep, uh, keeps evolving, uh, you know, we'll have to increase this proportion. So, of course, it is uh, a very difficult uh, challenge, very tricky challenge. If we look at uh, smallpox, we had to make this vaccination mandatory because Europe, especially, but it, it is also true in the US, had the uh, rise of smallpox cases, whereas this uh, disease had been almost er totally eradicated in our country. So it raises the question of the target issue of the, the target of the, you know, for the vaccination, which was done to start with because of the number of limited, because of a limited number of doses, we needed to protect the most fragile members of the population. So in most countries, we started vaccinating older people, the older segment of the population who could die because age is the main risk factor to uh, have a grave, uh, severe form of this um, virus. So we had to protect the most fragile segments of the population, but also to protect our healthcare system, which uh, was number one in this uh, crisis, and which called for lockdown measures, which had to be implemented last year. The question we face now, we have a vaccine in doses available in our countries, and we fortunate enough for that. So how are we going to get this herd immunity or collective immunity? And what is the vaccination policy that will be implemented? Well, two objectives. First, protection of the most fragile uh, members of the population. About 15% of the uh, people over 65 uh, did not get a, a vaccine. Uh, we have to do our best. You know, an African colleague uh, talked about, you know, going to the population to uh, get people vaccinated. Uh, France really have to do things to get to these people who are not vaccinated today. Some do not wish to do so, but uh, some are in what we call the hesitation, you know, and they, if we could only give them access to the vaccination, rather to go to register on Dr. Lib and to go and uh, go and get the, you know, we should go and vaccinate them. So the priority objectives today remains to go and vaccinate these uh, at-risk uh, people, because if they get infected by the virus, we'll go to hospital and will probably uh, cause what we call a sort of a um, congestion of in a hospital, but we cannot handle all these patients, and therefore we need to we need to use a very constraining, uh, stringent measures of uh, we know which impact the economy and social life, and we know this crisis had major impact on children, on uh, young people, students, uh, not just in terms of health care but also the the, the, consequ um, the the psychological or social consequences of their social measures and on their access to education with a high inequality between the less least favored and the most favored so we are in a, we're facing a situation uh, today when we have more doses than people who get to come to be vaccinated so we have a stock an excess stock of uh, doses and we must do our best to use the doses as quickly as possible and uh, make the vaccination mandatory for the uh, healthcare uh, employees well it's well if we need to uh, 
uh, impose such a constraint for people to be vaccine, uh, vaccinated, well, means that we missed the communication, the education. I think communication today is not sufficient, uh, you know, when it comes to vaccination, not sufficient uh, on the interest of the vaccine, uh, on the, inter the data we have on safety and so on and so forth. We, m we must improve our communication process broader, uh, more open. Uh, of course, those are new vaccines, but now we have C six months follow up. You know, we vaccinated three billion people in the world. Uh, we must communicate more openly if it's not efficient, which is most likely. Well, should it be mandatory in the same with like sanction for people who do not get a vaccine, or should it be some kind of a disguised? vaccination and people who are not vaccinated will not have access to uh, public events, restaurants, uh, cinemas, uh, theaters, uh, travel. And uh, if they wish to travel, well, they must pay for the test to travel. I mean, I don't see why today uh, the French population should pay for people who do not want to have a vaccine, which is free and for which we'll do a free test twice a week if uh, they want to go uh, to attend public events. So I would be more for this type of constraint than an obligation. Yeah. Well, generalization of the healthcare, of the sanitary pass. Yes, uh, pass. And people have to accept their choices, you know, and pay, you know, and accept the consequences of the choices. But we can't keep uh, going like this, you know, with people who are just uh, rejecting vaccination, where we see that today, the, uh, Akiko, you need to. Yes, I have a question. Often I hear people say that there are medical contraindications to the vaccine. Is it true? Well, those are people who don't want to be vaccinated. You know, contraindications are almost none. Uh, there is no contraindication per se. I mean, some people will respond more or less to vaccination. This holds true for people whose uh, immune system is is weaker, you know, transplanted patient or uh, grafted patient. And uh, we know that those, uh, these vaccines will work less. And the only thing for them to be safe is that they're, they're, they're next of kin should be vaccinated. They know there is no contraindication to vaccination. Dr. Sidi, could you possibly write, in Africa there are reluctances or not? Some don't want to get vaccined. So you're asking me if uh, there are also hesitations in Africa, do we have, do you have the same problem we have in rich countries? Sometimes, because in fact it's you know very much like a roller coaster. You know, when communication takes place, you know people go and get vaccinated, you know, en masse. But if you if we don't communicate for a long time with the you know the all the indica the all the messages that go on the social networks, uh, people fear vaccination. So I think we have to rework on vaccination. This is why during the last uh, meeting of the uh, of the. Uh, the management of uh, epidemics in Senegal, it was accepted by all that we need to reinforce communication and to have a communication plan uh, more aggressive and especially to respond to the uh, virus that circulates. So everything goes well, even though there could be hesitation in some places. In the departments in the region, there are regions where even the vaccines will uh, uh, will end because or will die because people will rush to get vaccine, but others where people don't want to be vaccine. So it all depends on the. It's at the local level, at the national level, because doctors, GPs who are at the local level should be able to talk to the population. So it is a problem that we have to live with. You all know that there are uh, people who have all the vaccines with no exception. So we have to accept that and see how we will organize ourselves to, to deal with this and continue our vaccination campaign. This is most important. I have a question on Twitter, which is in line with the question I wanted to ask you, Marisa Tourelle, which is uh, dear to Philippe Allion. Should there be a European agency very much like the U.S. agency that would implement innovations. Should we concentrate 
at the regional level, at the uh, European uh, at the European level, the vaccination issue, and how he, what is the role of all of WHO? Should we reform the WHO? I don't know if we need to uh, reform the WHO, but we certainly need to restructure the multilateral system by giving, as I was saying earlier, by giving a political lead to these agencies, you know, uh, to these organizations who work well, who work uh, in their corridors, you know, in their for decades, and be it uh, United uh, global, global Fund, or you know, and who, which represents what I call the uh, project multilateralism, you know, which is operational, concrete, uh, facilitating, and highly efficient because we know what we need to do, and we do it well. But we need, we can sit, we need a political force, you know, a political expression. At the European level, there is the ERA project. Well, we need one at the multilateral level, international, and of course, there is another, this is another question that we also, of course, the European Commission, the European Union uh, should have this research agency, should have the a pre crisis prevention capability much stronger potent than what exists today there is a crisis uh, sort of mitigation center which uh, never functions so the, the international reflection be it at the multilateral or regional scale for each of the concerned region should ponder the preparation and the mitigation of the coming crisis and we should let's hope that covid-19 will not be just some kind of a disastrous and deadly epidemics, but it should be give us the opportunity to reshuffle, rethink the uh, healthcare research uh, system. Those are domains of innovation, of transformation of the economy. Those are domains of uh, human development, and therefore, honestly, Europe, uh, because it is its value, Europe should uh, appear, uh, you know, as the is uh, the spearhead. Uh, the, 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 you know, the flagship uh, of, uh, in this domain, you know, a strong Europe in research and healthcare is the guarantee of multilateral action, international action, more humanistic, um, uh, based on solidarity vis-à-vis uh, -vis countries of the South. And I'm absolutely convinced that the European commitment is good for Europe, but is good for the rest of the world as well. Two minutes left, so we may take one or two questions. Thank you for your presentations. Do you think that we we could we could respond to the, um, the 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 rejection of scientific discourse to other scientific scientific discourse? Odile Lone, how would you react to that? I think one of the lessons drawn from this crisis is that we did we did communicate a lot, possibly. To too much. Uh, many people felt uh, uh, came up as experts, you know, by communicating on topics for which they had no expertise or no legitimacy. So there is a responsibility from the scientists, some who accepted to respond to uh, questions for which they were not, they had no legitimacy to do so. And the media played a major role in this crisis. They over communicated, often by inviting uh, so called experts who just fueled the controversy. So uh, we have to work on, uh, on this uh, issue of communication. We, as experts, we are not trained to do uh, communication for the uh, for the public, you know, public at large, and it's a new form of communication vis-à-vis -vis our students. And I think as well that it should be done using the media, who should, in this, uh, in this case, should the media should take its responsibilities and accept to have high-quality communication uh, and to avoid uh, controversy and uh, and uh, not targeting uh, sort of a high 
audience rating. Madam, your question and we're done. I have a question to Mrs. Touraine early on. You talked about uh, reform, the reforming the WHO. Now, for the implementation of the COVAX program, can we still trust WHO? We saw how the WHO uh, poorly managed the crisis. It was uh, like disastrous. We saw how the World Health Organization is unable to uh, do an uh, independent uh, investigation. Three days ago, I read that the WHO is blaming Europe and the European uh, country, but not that they don't recognize the Chinese uh, vaccine. I know the situation of the vaccine, uh, the va Chinese vaccine. China does not recognize any Western uh, vaccine, and WHO says nothing about this lack of reciprocity. So my question is, if the, the WHO does not reform, can we trust them? Not, not enough time to go into details, uh, you know, you, this is a you know, fundamental question about the role of WHO. While I'll be less severe vis-a-vis uh, -vis WHO, even though indeed uh, uh, it, it, uh, they did make, make, they did make c serious mistakes and they still do. COVAX is not actually driven by WHO. And my, to, my discourse is to say that regardless of the, of the WHO, we need uh, to provide such structures, you know, United and others, which are grouped or pooled within this uh, coalition of agency we call ACTA, which is International Response Accel Accelerator of uh, Tools to Respond to COVID at the initial level. We need to give it a political structuration, which is not necessarily the WHO. And therefore, therefore, is it at the level of the United Nations Security Council? Is it in the G20? Is it our own specific uh, political structuration? This can be discussed, you know. This is being debated in within international bodies. WHO is not necessarily the structure which is able, because of its uh, budget structure and uh, its uh, operational uh, competences, which do not exist. It is a normative agency. It defines what should be done, but it does not do things on site. So possibly WHO is not the suitable structure, but we need a political structuration. This is what it is. Just as what was missing in the European Union or the European Commission was a political process. The European Commission turned into a vaccine purchasing center, whereas we wanted a political vision. So now there are agencies which are personally very efficient, but in order to really influence things, they need to be politically structured. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Dr. Saidi. Thank you, Kiko. Thank you all. Continue. Le cercle.